To those who are joining us for the first time, we are very pleased to have you at this RSAA event. Uh, for those uh, who are with us on a regular basis, welcome back. I am Michael Ryder and our speaker today is Ike Fryman. Uh, Ike holds an um, MPhil from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Henry Scholar, an AM in Asian Studies from Harvard University, where he won the Joseph Fletcher Prize for the top thesis in Asian Studies, and an AB in East Asian History with highest honours also from Harvard. Currently at Balliol College, Oxford, his research examines why democratic countries engage with China's One Belt, One Road initiative and how Chinese mega projects influence their domestic politics. His book, One Belt, One Road, Chinese Power Meets the World, was published in November last year. In it, uh, he argues that the infrastructure projects are a sideshow to something else. Uh, Xi Jinping's project to restore China's greatness in world affairs and to solidify his place at the helm of a new Chinese empire. Some would say that a shared view of the past is a necessary precondition for a shared national identity. Certainly governments of all characters have at times found it useful to try to shape national narratives to their own priorities and to limit, prevent or dismiss scholarly scrutiny. Mike Fryman's talk to us today is about just such a case of the past being put to the service of a contemporary political goal, in the words of his title, making the past serve the present. I will take questions after his talk. Please use the Q&A button that you will find at the bottom of your screen if you have a question that you would like to ask. But for now, I will hand over to Ike. Thank you, Michael, for that, for having me here and for that very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to everyone here for zooming in. I hope you had a good holiday. And particularly if you're in the UK right now, that you're keeping safe and healthy. Uh, I'd like to show some slides. Uh, this will be begin the first section of the talk today. I hope to speak for no more than about 30 minutes and then to open up to questions and discussion uh, with all of you. I'm here today to talk about my new book, One Belt, One Road, Chinese Power Meets the World, and in particular, chapter three of this book, where we talk about how the Belt and Road concept has been described, refined, and fleshed out ideologically in Chinese language propaganda. I'm going to uh, put forward a number of rather provocative suggestions and I'm going to focus in the talk on walking through what I think is the single most authoritative piece of Belt and Road propaganda, which is the first episode of a six part documentary series, also called One Belt, One Road, that aired on Chinese central television in 2016. And through that exercise, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the ancient Silk Road as it has been uh, re-described, reimagined, and in many ways rewritten under the rule of Xi Jinping and talk about what that can tell us about Xi Jinping's objectives and China's sense of its emerging place in the world order. Xi Jinping visited Kazakhstan in September 2013, only a few months after taking office, uh, to launch the project that would define his legacy. The One Belt, One Road initiative nominally refers to two trade routes. One, an overland Silk Road economic belt connecting China to Europe, and another, a maritime Silk Road on the sea, which uh, traces the rim of South China, uh, the South China Sea, through the Straits of Malacca, along the rim of the Indian Ocean, and finally through the Suez Canal, terminating in Southern Europe. Uh, the questions that most Western scholars have asked when they evaluate One Belt, One Road, uh, suggests that they think that it is fundamentally an infrastructure uh, or, or overseas development project. The questions that they ask have to do with infrastructure financing. Are the projects viable or not? Can recipient countries handle the debt? Uh, they ask questions in Washington about how these infrastructure projects link up to one another. Uh, trying to map them uh, through geographic software. Uh, 
and asking perhaps whether they are uh, the, the fundamental infrastructure that the People's Liberation Army could use as it internationalizes its uh, overseas footprint. Economists have also argued that the Belt and Road could be a domestic economic uh, reform project, a, a vehicle for dumping excess capacity from China's bloated state-owned sector into China's neighbors. Uh, and some, from a geopolitical perspective, have argued that the Belt and Road is a strategy inspired by the late 19th century writer, Halford Mackinder, to dominate the Eurasian landmass as perhaps a precursor to world domination. Now, China has in some ways pursued all of these goals, but I'm not here to talk today about the physical infrastructure underlying the Belt and Road or the relationships between China and its many recipient and partner countries. For that, I would encourage you to buy and look at the rest of the book. I'm gonna talk specifically about how the Belt and Road has been institutionalized and written into uh, the corpus of Chinese ideological products uh, through, in particular, the 19th Party Congress in September of 2017, when it was written into the National Party Constitution alongside Xi Jinping thought, and also the propaganda that had been used to explain what this program is actually about to domestic and to foreign audiences. I'm gonna argue that there is an underappreciated and in fact, very effective way to think about one, one Belt and Road is and what is driving it, which is that it is a domestic political campaign with global implications. During the Cultural Revolution, uh, Mao Zedong skillfully used propaganda to write himself into the pantheon of uh, Chinese leaders or of the, the, the heroes of the communist cause. The, like this image, for example, shows Mao as the latest iteration of Marx and Engels, Lenin and Stalin. But similarly, I'm going to argue, Xi Jinping has picked his own historical avatar. And that is Hanu Di, the great emperor of the Han Dynasty who ruled from 141 to 87 BC. Uh, Belt and Road propaganda for Chinese audiences, although less so for foreign audiences, make very clear that this is the correct historical juxtaposition, that Xi Jinping is restoring or revitalizing a project begun 2000 years ago by Hanu Di. And the claim is being made that thanks to Hanu Di's strategic wisdom, uh, the Silk Road brought China to its apex of power, glory, and prestige in the global system. And Xi Jinping is therefore a virtuous traditionalist who is going to restore that ancient order in a modern form. It is no small thing for a Chinese leader to dare to compare himself to Hanu Di. This is a man who for thousands of years has been treated by imperial and then communist historiographers as one of the greatest or perhaps the single greatest emperor in Chinese history. He doubled the territorial extent of the Han Dynasty, annexing what are now the provinces of Fujian, Guangdong, Guangxi, Yunnan. He invaded Vietnam successfully. He invaded the Korean Peninsula largely successfully. And he launched military incursions into Central Asia, uh, which annexed the Husi Corridor in modern day Gansu province and set up his successors to annex what is now modern day Xinjiang, uh, what in ancient times they referred to as the Western regions, uh, establishing Chinese superiority in Central Asia that would wax and wane, but essentially last through the Ming Dynasty over 1500 years later. But of all of the things that Chinese historiographers have credited Hanu Di with over the years, uh, many decades of territorial expansion, but also economic expansion, peace, harmony at home, cultural flourishing, one thing that Chinese historians never gave him credit for was founding the ancient Silk Road. In fact, the very notion that China had anything to do with the founding of the ancient Silk Road was a Western idea. It was proposed by the Swedish Nazi sympathizer and cartographer Sven Hayden in the 1930s. And he proposed it, inventing a historical backstory to the ancient Silk Road that it had in fact been founded by Han Wudi himself because he wanted to persuade the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek 
to cooperate with uh, the Third Reich in building an overland uh, trading network, a highway, and eventually a flight path between Germany and East Asia. So when, when Hedden proposed his history of the ancient Silk Road in 1938 and argued that China should lead the rebuilding of it, he was pilloried in the Chinese press and by Chinese scholars. In fact, the People's, uh, rather not the People's Daily, but a, a prestigious Chinese uh, uh, commentator uh, called it dismissively the so-called Silk Road, the Suo Wei, the Sujarjulu, to show just how unseriously Chinese historians took his claims. And yet it stuck because over the course of the seven decades in which the People's Republic of China uh, has attempted to assert its own place in uh, China's imperial history, there has been an effort to brand some of Chinese uh, cooperative projects and diplomatic relations with, in particular, Central Asia as part of a Silk Road spirit or a Sushojulu Jingshan, which is said to be essentially a metaphor for peaceful exchange and cooperation between China and its neighbors. Before Xi Jinping, truly, the metaphor of a new Silk Road had not gone much farther than that. Some Chinese bureaucrats had tried to deploy it or Chinese state-owned enterprises had tried to evoke it as an excuse for business deals that they wanted to do with China's Central Asian neighbors. Xi Jinping's successors, or predecessors, such as Wen Jiabao, mentioned it occasionally on overseas trips. But it was not until 2016, under Xi Jinping, when the Chinese Ministry of Education undertook a full-scale rewrite of the national history textbooks, which every Chinese secondary school student must study, that the, uh, the history of the underlying Silk Road was rewritten from the bottom up. And I'd like to talk a little bit right now about what that entailed. But rather than going through the text of the textbook, which might bore you, I'm going to show a 30 second clip and some uh, film stills that might summarize it in an easier to grasp way. So to summarize the changes in the textbook revisions, Chinese Central Television in 2016 uh, published a or promulgated a documentary series intending to explain Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road proposition to Chinese audiences. Rather than talking anymore, let me just show you. This is, this is the promo. So what I'd like to talk about now is what the first episode of this series does following the promo. It lays out exceptionally clearly Xi Jinping's vision for what the ancient Silk Road is and what it means for the present. So let's take a look and see what they have to say. If you don't believe, by the way, that this is the most authoritative presentation of what the party believes the Belt and Road to be, consider the foreign VIPs who make cameo appearances in this series. You've got Henry Kissinger, Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Vladimir Putin, and a number of other current and former national leaders, including the former Prime Minister of France, uh, the Pre Prime Minister of Belarus, and others. It begins with a reverential reenactment of Xi Jinping's speech in Kazakhstan, announcing the initiative. And it then goes on to talk about the philosophy underlying the ancient Silk Road, something it calls Oriental Wisdom or Dongfang Zhihui. This is said to represent uh, the apex of Chinese cultural learning, uh, but it is a, in a sense a theory of international relations in which uh, national, uh, nations interact through a model of cooperation rather than conflict, and China with its cultural superiority and economic and technological centrality is implicitly acknowledged by all to be the center of the international system a gravitational force that holds the entire Asian region in its embrace uh, and ensures peaceful and orderly exchanges of people, ideas, and goods across borders. This is set in juxtaposition to Western science, which, as, which is portrayed throughout the series as pitiful and flawed. Uh, this is Archimedes measuring the earth, but we're told, of course, that he miscalculated 
He didn't see that there was a place for China in his map. And back in the imperial court, China is not only uh, speeding ahead technologically, it's also developing a vision for geopolitical cooperation and expansion. This is Han Udi uh, authorizing his loyal deputy Zhang Qian uh, to go forth into Central Asia, make friends with the nomadic tribes there and build a coalition to expand Han Dynasty power. In the ancient textbooks, Zhang Qian was represented as a simple explorer or emissary. And in fact, insofar as he was conducting diplomacy, he was preparing for a series of brutal, savage military conquests by the Han Dynasty to expand the territorial extent. But in this series, this is an entirely peaceful enterprise and Zhang Qian is celebrated purely for his loyalty and submission to the emperor's wishes. So this, we're reminded, establishes a period of unprecedented power, wealth, and in particular unity in China. Uh, and Zhang Qian goes forth and pretty soon Chinese technological products such as silk end up in the hands of Westerners. Now we're shown a series of stills and uh, montages of Westerners in togas fondling Chinese silk. They've never seen anything like it and they catch the bug. Now we are told for a thousand years, they will think of nothing else but trying to find faster ways to China in order to access Chinese products more effectively. This is now rendered through the metaphor uh, or the motif of camels traipsing through the desert in caravans. And we're told that for a thousand years, the peaceful spirit of the Silk Road reigned with China at the apex of the international system, even though Western technology lags far behind, there's virtually no conflict in the world for about a millennium. This professor, uh, Liu Yingsheng from Nanjing University, even says that the only reason the Westerners discovered the new world in the first place was because they had heard the stories of Marco Polo and wanted a faster way to China. Truly, if this documentary is to, if we're to take it at its word, Westerners are thinking of nothing else. But then as if by accident, the Europeans discover the new world and the world enters into a new and darker period in its history. The Europeans begin a path of colonial expansion, trade monopoly, we're told. Immediately, the lighting gets dark, the music gets frightful and scary. And the narrator starts to tell us about the destruction that the Western model has wreaked on the world order. We're told that the Western model has destroyed the climate. It leads to chaos, destruction, and war. And even its, its leader, the United States, is portrayed as a complete mess. Either we're shown Wall Street in the rain or the streets of Manhattan strewn with trash. Clearly, this is a failed model for global order and it pales in comparison to the Silk Road spirit, perhaps because it, lasts, it lacks oriental wisdom or Dong Fang Jiu But then in 1949, the Chinese Communist Party comes to power and the Chinese people, Zhang Xilai, they stand up. And all of a sudden, the pace of the series picks up. The music turns positive and hopeful, and we are given a rat -a -tat of historical statistics as the Chinese Communist Party makes China great and strong again. The third world nations are rejoicing at independence, but they don't know what to do. They're helpless and aimless without Chinese leadership. So at the Bandung Conference of 1955, they asked China for help in spearheading their own development. Mindful of its, its his, historical legacy at the apex of the Silk Road, we're told China has no choice but to answer the call. And so skipping over the rest of the Maoist era, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, we are plunged into the post-1978 era of reform and opening up. And in the space of about three minutes in the series, China becomes the world export powerhouse. Their wealth and foreign exchange reserves grow inexorably. They catch up from trying to build cars with wooden hammers to printing, doing laser cutting, building advanced automobiles with machines, high-speed rail, uh, uh, civilian airlines, and space exploration. And boom, they are back at the apex, not only culturally, but also technologically. Now what? Well, we are told the rest of the world is calling on China to share its wisdom and experience once again. 
and revitalize the global order along the lines of the ancient Silk Road. Uh, the documentary does this by introducing a number of characters in recipient countries. They have a particular fondness for little girls who we are told just want to take the fast train and see what out, what's out there. They just want to escape the poverty trap where they come from. And they see China and the projects or investments uh, that China can bring to their hometown as a way to achieve their personal dreams. Who's better to build a fast train, of course, than China, which has nearly three quarters of the global high-speed rail supply. We're also told that foreigners aren't just going to ask nicely for Chinese contributions. They're also going to show submission when they're given what they want. This is a herdsman named Moktel in Mongolia whose village is tragically plunged into darkness again and again because their electrical generators don't work. We're introduced to a Chinese engineer who drives over the border in the dead of night to fix things. And Moktel invites the Chinese uh, engineer to his home for Christmas and gives him a long toast, thanking him for giving us electricity. We're told that Moktel's primitive existence on the grassland will be transformed thanks to Chinese technology. If you want to summarize the value proposition that One Boat, One Road is offering to Chinese people in a single image, I think it is this one, which is that China is not giving these uh, technologies or investments away for free. It is being repaid, not necessarily dollar for dollar, but in terms of recognition of its status and submission from its neighbors. Finally, we are told the Belt and Road construction workers who take risks to uh, build Chinese projects overseas and cooperate with foreigners, they may face risks and they may face setbacks, but this is a uh, an illustration of a museum, I believe, in Kyrgyzstan that is already memorializing Belt and Road construction workers. These loyal servants of the cause will enter the history books just as Zhang Qian did. So as we can see, this is telling a story not only about China's relationship to the rest of the world, but also to Xi, but, uh, a story about Xi Jinping and the proper relationships of his subjects to him. Now, if you have followed any of the propaganda of the Belt and Road for foreigners, you may notice that the story I have just told has very little in common with the Belt and Road propaganda that is being promulgated for English language audiences. In fact, one of the bizarre things is that the Chinese Central Propaganda Department has put hardly any money or resources into creating high quality propaganda to explain to Westerners why they should not be afraid of this. This, which is one of the six Belt and Road bedtime stories produced by China Daily, is as far as I can find, uh, the highest budget piece of Belt and Road audiovisual propaganda produced for Westerners. Let's take a watch and see if we can see the differences. A few years ago, China's President Xi Jinping was making new routes. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative. More stuff can move around the world more easily and people can travel more easily and build things need. This is where I'm really suffering. I'll tell you tomorrow, sweetie, okay? It's time for you to go to sleep. Okay, Papa. Hey, Lily. Time for bed. You said the Belt Road wasn't just about moving stuff from country to country. What do you mean? Okay, I'll tell you. It's not just about roads and rails and airports to move stuff.
the claim, of course, is that China isn't doing anything extraordinarily threatening to foreigners. In fact, it's inviting foreigners in and all it wants to do is share. And isn't this something that children can understand? Well, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that China is spinning very different versions of this world that it is trying to build to domestic and to foreign audiences. And if you're a foreigner, only a child would ever believe it. So where does this leave us? The Xi Jinping era has elevated historical revisionism to a new level, uh, even by the standards of Chinese historiography. Uh, the war against Korea has been uh, recast as a war of resistance against American hegemonic expansionism. The war of resistance against Japan, my Oxford advisor, Rana Mitter has argued, has become foundational to cementing the legitimacy of the ruling CCP. But while these references are important because they relate to party rule, uh, the changes that the Chinese Communist Party has made to this underlying Silk Road history uh, are, I think, more significant because they relate to Xi Jinping himself and his personal personality cult. Xi Jinping is being portrayed as a visionary leader for launching a world historical transformation to restore Han Yudi's legacy, and also a virtuous traditionalist because he's a student of history. Uh, this is also not a, um, an unambitious project. Its goal is to restore China's status at the centerpiece of the global system and to rebuild what one may argue is a tributary relationship between China and its neighboring countries. I'd like to read a quote. This is the definition of the imperial tributary system from a 2005 Chinese history textbook. In ancient China, the textbook says, foreign trade was under the control of the government and tribute trade, which occupied, sorry, which consisted of tribute and reward occupied an important position. Tribute trade tended to give much and receive little in return. The money paid by Chinese buyers to the foreign sellers was always several times higher than the offered price. Its purpose was not to obtain maximum economic benefits, but to promote state power and strengthen ties with foreign countries. This definition of the tributary system sounds exactly like what the CCTV documentary is describing. And if you read between the lines, it is also what the bedtime story is describing. In 1964, Mao Zedong uh, advised a student that the purpose of history education should be to make the past serve the present and to make the foreign serve China. I would argue that Xi Jinping, by making the Silk Road a centerpiece of his personality cult, is undertaking a rather similar lesson. Um, if we actually look at the history of Han Yudi's reign, we might see that there are other less favorable resonances to Xi Jinping's own rule. Han Yudi's overseas adventurism did wreck the imperial finances and put, some very, put his successors in a very difficult position. Uh, he had to create government monopolies over salt and, over salt and steel to raise cash, uh, which created governance problems for the rest of the Han dynasty. And in fact, this is not so dissimilar to what Xi Jinping has done himself, consolidating his power over the state sector. Han Udi also ruled with an iron fist. We may forget that he ordered draconian crackdowns on intellectuals throughout his reign, and he even ordered the castration of the famed imperial historian Sima Qian. In his later years, Han Udi became paranoid, obsessed with immortality and borderline megalomaniacal. So as we study this history, it is worth remembering that these are, history can tell us many ways in which the Belt and Road Project could go awry as it becomes ever closer to Xi Jinping's own personality cult. But if the Belt and Road really is a neo-imperial project to resurrect the, to the tributary system and to rally the party state around this goal, just as Zhang Qian once formally, uh, formally served his lord, then I would argue that perhaps we have misdiagnosed the nature of the Belt and Road Project. This is not fundamentally about building infrastructure, distributing vaccines, 
or any substantial policy engagement with the world. This is fundamentally an ideological project to put Xi Jinping at the center of the Chinese system and to make the world serve China just as the past serves the present. Uh, and with that, I will conclude my remarks and I would love to hear some of your questions and engage a little bit with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for uh, that wonderful overview. One of our um, audience asks, I have read recently that um, One Belt, One Road is on the back burner now. Um, can you comment? Yes. So the Belt and Road has encountered a number of difficulties in the last year. Uh, first of all, the United States under the Trump administration decided that it would finally begin to treat this as a geopolitical threat and to explicitly uh, try to cajole or coerce its allies and partners not to join. Uh, the Trump administration has also tried to propagate a meme that the Belt and Road is a debt trap diplomacy project uh, in which China plays the role of a loan shark pushing uh, high interest loans on developing countries. And this, uh, this meme has become quite widespread and many developing countries have started engaging with it in their domestic debates. At the same time, China's foreign direct investment collapsed uh, over the course of 2020, thanks to the coronavirus epidemic. It now becomes, it has now become clear that China is going to lose a great deal of money on the hundreds of billions of dollars it has poured into overseas projects. And at the National Development and Reform Commission and the major banks, there's now a discussion about how to narrow the scope of the initiative going forward uh, into domains where China and its partner countries are taking on less risk and try to achieve similar political objectives in a less capital intensive way. Uh, but if you look at speeches that Xi Jinping himself has made over the past six months, I think it's quite clear that the brand of the Belt and Road itself is not going anywhere. In fact, I think that if the Chinese successfully pivot it into these three new domains that they're talking about, public health, which includes vaccines, green tech and digital services, it might actually offer a more attractive value proposition to partner countries because it won't actually force them to take on billions of dollars in debt to build long-term high-risk projects that could easily go awry. So I think that insofar as this is, Xi Jinping has tied himself to, to the mast of this thing, he's gonna find it very difficult to kill off. And while the substantial projects that are undertaken under the aegis of the Belt and Road may change fundamentally. Uh, I think the ideological campaign, uh, particularly in, within China, is likely to continue largely unaffected. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, coronavirus there, and I, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but um, one, uh, one listener has has asked the, the following question. Do you think the latest pandemic was deliberate or accidental part of Chinese expansionary plan? Well, I'll set aside the question of whether the pandemic was deliberate or accidental. We will never know, right? The Trump administration has claimed that it has evidence that the virus escaped from a lab in Wuhan. Uh, Matt Pottinger, who is the former senior director for Asia in the National Security Council and now deputy national security advisor, one of the most respected Trump administration officials uh, among those who don't particularly like Trump, um, came out this week again stating that the US government has evidence to this effect. But of course, China will deny it. We won't know. To a certain extent, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a huge reputational blow to China's efforts to put itself at the center of the international system. Because as the world knows, it was thanks to the obfuscation and dishonesty of local officials in Wuhan that China deceived the world about the uh, nature of human to human transmission in Wuhan and refused to shut down international travel out of the city during the Chinese New Year until late January. So, I think it is not for nothing that the, for example, Pew survey shows public opinion about China plummeting in basically every Western country that they have surveyed. But another way to think about this is 2020 was the year 
that China gave up uh, for good, worrying about what Western countries thought about it. And you can think about the rise of the so-called wolf warriors in the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs as exemplary, as illustri illustrative of that trend. I think the Belt and Road has always been about putting China at the center of an international coalition of developing countries, of post-colonial countries. And this is hearkening, about, hearkening back to a Maoist idea that China is the rightful leader of the third world. I think in 2021, as China tries to use di vaccine diplomacy uh, to, to fix its image, it's actually going to find a lot of willing partners in the developing world. And that has more to do with the fact that Western countries are hoarding vaccine supply than anything else. I certainly would rather have a Western vaccine that has been peer reviewed and where the results have been published in a reputable uh, journal than a Chinese vaccine that I'm taking basically on faith. Uh, but if I'm the Philippines or Brazil, if I'm South Africa or Indonesia, I might not have a choice. And so I think China will focus on repairing its relations with the developing world. And insofar as that was their plan all along, coronavirus is just a bump in the road. Thank you. Um, it, going to China's neighbors, uh, Carolyn Brown asked, given the visceral hostility among public opinion in at least three of the five Central Asian nations towards Chinese expansionism, what prospects do you see for the land-based element in Xi's One Belt, One Road beyond trade financing projects of state sponsorship? That's a terrific question. And thank you for asking it. The Belt and Road concept, uh, or the rather the New Silk Road concept, was pioneered in the Chinese bureaucracy. First of all, it was it was first proposed, as far as I can tell, by uh, a Kyrgyz politician in the 90s, uh, as in, in the hopes of creating an international institution in Central Asia that would restrain China's potential revanchist tendencies. It's, it's worth remembering that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which we think of now as essentially a venue for China and Russia to talk about security cooperation, was originally created largely thanks to the diplomatic efforts of the Central Asian republics, which wanted a international regional framework that could constrain uh, the two superpowers competing over the much weaker states in between. Uh, over the course of the 2000s, uh, the first wave of Chinese foreign direct investment uh, was focused on Central Asia because it was an effort by state-owned enterprises to extract minerals, oil and timber and aluminum, uh, things of this nature from countries like Kazakhstan. Uh, and when Xi Jinping went to Kazakhstan to announce the Belt and Road, I think a lot of foreign observers believed, well, this is obviously an effort to link China and Central Asia more closely together. But by all of the quantitative metrics that we have, it doesn't actually seem clear that Central Asia has been a priority destination for foreign investment. In fact, in the five years after the Belt and Road was announced, it was Southeast Asia, uh, which has a lot of far more developed and fast growing countries, which was the recipient of the fastest growing um, increase in FDI. And even though China trumpets the success and the expansion of Trans-Eurasian Rail, uh, rail transit only represents a, a tiny fraction, a negligible share of China's total exports. It is always going to be cheaper to, trans, uh, to transport goods on uh, giant uh, uh, merchant ships than over thousands of miles of ungoverned, largely ungoverned and depopulated territory in Central Asia. So I think to a certain extent, China has used the Belt and Road to achieve a parity, a strategic parity or a balance of power with Russia in Central Asia. And it is basically happy with that. And the priority destinations for the Belt and Road are, are regions that China regards as more strategic, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America spring to mind. Thank you. How have the events in Galwan in the last year, impacted here? I mean, were they uh, calculated uh, in Chinese policy circles? Um, have they driven India closer to the West? 
Um, how does um, how does that fit? Are there other factors uh, in the geostrategic friction between India and China? And um, adjacent to that, geographically at least, um, can you say something about how important Pakistan is to China in this context, given that it places so much importance on its relationship to counter its hostile relationship with India? The fact that India and China don't like each other very much is not a new phenomenon. They've been fighting wars for hundreds of years over contested territory in the Himalayas. And at the Bandung Conference of 1965 that I touched on earlier, it was actually the, uh, the disagreements between Nehru and Zhou Enlai uh, that led to the, the failure of the non-aligned movement to coalesce into a proper bloc. Uh, the Indians and the Chinese both saw themselves as the rightful leaders of the decolonized world. And this was the, the, the main schism in that, in that community. And there's all sorts of reasons why the two superpowers would dislike or distrust each other. Uh, India, when the Belt and Road was first announced, much like Russia, Japan, and other regional powers, I think saw this as largely a symbolic, uh, not very substantial project. And so they signed on. They sent government representatives to the first Belt and Road Forum. There are, in fact, official lists that are still published on the website of the Belt, the, the Belt and Road, as a, the, the Belt and Road's website run by the Chinese state, by the state council, uh, which lists India as a member state in the Belt and Road, even though India has become, even more than the United States, uh, an active and hostile opponent and critic of the initiative. Um, since 2015, I think China has pivoted to using investment uh, and trade and similar tactics in more subtle ways to what they did previously in Sri Lanka uh, to try to pick off some of India's neighbors. Uh, Xi Jinping made a big trip to Nepal a couple of years ago where he announced a basket of aid. Uh, China has had some contentious relations with Bhutan, but it has tried to improve relations with Bangladesh. Uh, and India has been pushing back uh, through its proxies and by backing rival political parties. In countries like the Maldives, for example, there was a very pro-China party in power and India was able with the help of the United States to facilitate a transition of leadership to a new, uh, new government, which has been very hostile to the Belt and Road. I think the United States and India, or, 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 let me put it this way. One of the, I think, most significant strategic legacies of the Trump administration will be the Indo-Pacific strategy. The notion that the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are interlinked domains and that we should think we should treat them together. And that the correct venue for doing this is a quadrilateral between the United States, India, Australia, and Japan. And the Trump administration, this was not invented by the Trump administration, but Secretary Pompeo has done a great deal to facilitate um, uh, four-sided uh, dialogues uh, through intelligence sharing with the Indians and so forth. Uh, this is in response to the fact that the Belt and Road is to a large extent China's version of an Indo-Pacific strategy. So yes, I think India and China are not going to resolve their disagreements anytime soon. The PLA has clear designs on an operational footprint in the Indian Ocean, which will bring it into direct, uh, direct uh, contact with Indian vessels. Uh, and I think that this is a long-term challenge for China in terms of defending some of the infrastructure that it's trying to build uh, farther away than it has the ability to actively protect. Um, as far as China's relations with Pakistan, Pakistan has long been one of China's best friends. It is a troubled country. China try, tries to keep it close. It also knows that investments that it, make, it makes in Pakistan have the double impact of, uh, of, of distressing policymakers in India. But I think at this point, the China-Pakistan economic corridor has overextended itself. Pakistan is pretty clearly not going to be able to pay back all of the money that it has borrowed. And so the as much as Chinese and Pakistani politicians like to talk about it as a, as a gesture of friendship, they're not actually launching many new projects. 
they're in the process essentially of cutting their losses on a lot of projects that are not going to work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the um, uh, a couple of uh, questions here from Andrew Lung. If, if China is such a threat, why have Southeast Asian countries signed up for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership? Well, this is a great question. And this is one of the arguments that I develop in the second part of this book. So if One Belt, One Road is a project by China to recreate the ancient tributary system, from an American perspective, perhaps also from a British perspective, that seems like a frightening prospect. It's a revisionist exercise uh, to essentially alter the, the basic ideas underlying the international system in Asia um, and put China at the center to replace a Western model of international law with an imperial Chinese uh, concept of benevolent, uh, benevolent hegemony. Uh, so I think to an American ear, it would seem obvious that any country that actually learned about China's motivations would run away as fast as it possibly could. But one of the puzzles about the Belt and Road is India accepted and the Maldives accepted. Very few countries that have interacted with Belt and Road, even countries that have taken out loans that they can't repay, even countries that have built gigantic pieces of infrastructure that don't make money, have been much more likely to double down on their relationship with China, borrowing even more, signing even more trade deals or investment deals than to pull away altogether. And so I think that we have to ask why, if you stand in the shoes of a, a, a Belt and Road recipient country, you would tolerate the risk that borrowing all this money from China could allow China to turn you into a vassal state. And there's two points that I would make here. First of all, elites in Belt and Road partner countries are not stupid. They are highly sophisticated, often self-interested actors who have lots of experience dealing with international lenders. They know that foreign money always comes with political strings attached. But the Belt and Road or partnership with China in the abstract gives them leverage. It gives them leverage over domestic rivals, perhaps because it can help them stay in power by delivering roads or infrastructure or economic growth to their constituents before the next election. It delivers also regional geopolitical advantage. If you are Greece, for example, in the early 2010s, it, is, it behooves you to have a relationship with China because that gives you leverage as you renegotiate your debts with the IMF and with Germany and with Brussels. If you are Russia after the 2014 Ukraine crisis, and your relations with the West have soured and the US has slapped on sanctions. It behooves you to have a good relationship with China because you can show your people and your elites that you have strategic options. If you're Sri Lanka and you are a nationalist politician who takes power in the wake of a bloody civil war, and this is a country that has been borne the brunt of Indian meddling and influence over the course of hundreds of years, it is clearly in your interest to have a relationship with China because it allows you to assert a form of geopolitical autonomy. So I think Western policymakers who are frightened by the idea that China wants to rebuild the tributary system have to grapple with the reality that small states have more bargaining opportunities in a bipolar world than a unipolar world. And if you are a country like Malaysia, which does far more trade with China than with any other country. There is a powerful, re powerful set of incentives to make sure that your relations with Beijing are sufficiently smooth, uh, that you can, you can deliver what you have to deliver to your domestic constituencies in order to stay in power. So I think if, to conclude this rather rambling answer, if you're Washington or London and you want to come up with a strategy for dealing with this thing, the first step is to think about what it's like to stand in the shoes of a recipient country dealing with China and to understand that if the choice is between vassalage to the United States, as it's often perceived, or vassalage to Beijing, uh, many countries don't perceive that as such an easy choice to make. Thank you. Um, staying with neighbors and their attitudes 
um, for a moment longer. Um, the Uyghur, um, how do you think attitudes in countries neighboring China <clears throat> have been or will be affected by the suppression of ethnic and religious minority identities in Xinjiang and elsewhere in, uh, in China? First of all, what is happening in Xinjiang is horrendous. It's a form of cultural genocide. It is one of the great humanitarian crises of our time. And I think the Biden team recognizes that it will have to get serious about it. I think also in Europe and in the UK, there's a recognition looking at the crackdown on Hong Kong that we saw just a few hours ago. Something has to be done. Red lines have to be drawn uh, to show China what it can and cannot get away with in terms of violating human rights in areas where it does not have full sovereignty. So I think this is going to become, human rights will become a much bigger part of the Western policy towards China in 2021. And that will end up being blended with Western China policy towards the Belt and Road. In terms of China's own objectives through the Belt and Road, I don't think it has that much to do with what is happening in Xinjiang. I do think that China has been very concerned over the past five years with making sure that the world's largest and most powerful Muslim countries have a tacit understanding that they will not criticize China's human rights policies in Xinjiang. We saw this in the last Malaysian election, but we've also seen it through China's relations with Turkey, uh, which for a while, a few years ago, thought that it might stand up for the Uyghurs and has now toned down any comments to that effect. China is extremely dependent on oil imports from the Middle East, even more so than the United States was in the early 2000s when it launched the war in Iraq. This is a geopolitical dependence that China is going to have a very hard time breaking over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's why China has focused on cultivating relations with a, a range of countries in the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia and the UAE to Iran and Turkey, as well as with Israel. So I think that uh, over the course of the next decade, there's going to be an effort to consolidate relations, particularly with Arab autocrats, to make sure that if there is criticism of China's human rights policies at home, they're coming from Western countries and not from Islamic ones. And that has to do uh, to a certain extent with domestic political control. China doesn't want other countries, particularly Muslim countries to have the possibility to rile up China's, uh, China's Muslims uh, against the CCP. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, um, uh, move to a slightly different um, aspect now. Um, Nick Fielding comments, China is facing a major demographic crisis over the coming 70 years with massive numbers of elderly, major gender imbalance, ultra low total fertility rate and so on, leading to a projected halving of the present population by 2100. Um, won't these demographic problems overwhelm the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, does it not confirm that BRI is more propagandistic than anything else? It's an interesting question. I think that if, if I'm right and the Belt and Road is fundamentally an ideological project to secure Xi Jinping's own place in the history books, then it's not in fact, what some American commentators have feared, a, an uber strategic hundred year marathon master plan for China to take over the world. And based on my own understanding of China, my time living in China, interacting with Chinese uh, scholars and business people, my sense is that the, the CCP actually is much more short termist in its thinking than uh, American, Americans often give it credit for. Uh, China has very serious challenges ahead in terms of demographics. They've ended the one child policy. They're now trying to encourage fertility so far unsuccessfully. And the long, in the long term, the fact that China is not a desirable destination for high skilled immigrants is going to put China at a relative disadvantage to, to the West um, in terms of its ability to compete technologically and economically. 
But these are very long-term challenges. And I wouldn't want to speculate about demographics 100 years in the future. In the shorter term, I think it's, about, it's much more about consolidating domestic control and putting forward a model for China's relationships with its neighbors, which is modeled on an ancient uh, tributary idea. And I think if it, if it keeps Xi Jinping firmly in control domestically and allows China to build something of a sphere of influence in its neighborhood and across the developing world, then from Xi Jinping's own perspective, I think he'll deem it a success. Just following that, um, <clears throat> that thought about domestic political stability for a moment, Sally MacDonald comments that debt lent to Belt and Road countries now equates to 36% of Chinese nominal GDP. As it sours, as some of it is bound to, will it bring Xi down with it? I doubt it. If you, so yes, it is true. Since 2005, uh, China has lent over $2 trillion overseas. A great deal of that has been in the form of these infrastructure mega projects, which were of dubious creditworthiness even before the pandemic. Uh, China admitted over the course of the summer that over a third of Belt and Road projects have encountered pandemic related issues. That number is surely higher now. So I don't know, I can't put a number on how much Chinese state policy banks will have to write off. It's very possibly in the hundreds of billions of dollars. But this is a tolerable price to pay uh, from the perspective of a country that has over $3 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. So while this is in a sense a reputational blow to Xi Jinping, I would note that the pandemic in a perverse way um, has, has benefited Chinese enterprises that took on in completely unviable projects because it will now be almost impossible to sort out projects that were doomed from the start and projects that might have succeeded if not for the pandemic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just uh, we've, we've got uh, two or three questions um, relating to Hong Kong and Taiwan. So if I could just ask you to uh, say a word about those. Um, uh, first of all, is the situation in Hong Kong a setback for Xi? Um, and what implications do you think there are for the um, one country, two systems um, uh, principle? Uh, and I'll just say in passing on that, that uh, uh, anyone who wants to hear more about that could, um, could listen to the webinar that we held uh, back in uh, December on exactly this subject. Um, uh, is there going to be more of an appetite um, as well uh, for trying to reunite uh, with Taiwan as part of uh, an imperial legacy? So these questions are all very interesting and I'm always happy to, to ruminate on the, the future of Chinese foreign policy. I, I think though it's, it's very important not to conflate one belt, one road with Chinese foreign policy more generally. I think one of the conceptual issues, this is an argument I make in the book that many Westerners have, have, have had to grapple with is that because the Belt and Road is not clearly defined by China, geographically in terms of a list of member countries, in terms of a list of industries that are affected, because it's not easy for us to point to a given Chinese investment or project and say, no, this is definitely in the Belt and Road or definitely out of the Belt and Road. Its contours are so fuzzy that it ends up having this mirror-like quality and we can read into it whatever, we, whatever our priors are about uh, how China operates, what China's motivations are. I think it's important to separate the two. China is undertaking a great deal of, uh, well, first of all, they're spending money abroad that is not under the aegis of the Belt and Road. And they're also interacting with foreign countries in ways that are separate from the Belt and Road scheme. I think China perceives Hong Kong to be uh, a domestic issue, not a foreign policy issue. And so insofar as Hong Kong relates to the Belt and Road, this is something I talk about also in the book, it has been as a sort of litmus test of loyalty for Hong Kong elites and businesses. 
Uh, this was communicated very clearly to Hong Kong leaders. I interviewed some Hong Kong uh, business people for the book, and they told me essentially back in 2015, 16, we have no idea what this is actually about. Uh, we can speculate about what its economic or political goals may be. But what we know is that this is a slogan or buzzword that is very important in Beijing, and so we are expected to jump. I talk in the book about a Belt and Road themed conference that talked about putting the Belt and Road on the blockchain. I don't think that that was a centrally coordinated thing coming out of the NDRC or the State Council. I think that was an organization in Hong Kong that wanted to hold a conference about blockchain and thought that they would get more press and perhaps get some kudos if they appended the Belt and Road slogan to it. Uh, so yes, I think Xi Jinping very clearly has designs on integrating, the Hong Kong, integrating Hong Kong with the mainland. One country, two systems is effectively dead. Under the national security law, if mainland authorities can order a purge of an entire slate of candidates in a democratic election, it's not much of a democratic election at all. I think Xi Jinping also has designs on Taiwan and sees that too as a domestic political issue. Uh, but I think that they're distinct from the Belt and Road and it's really important to keep that distinction in mind. Hey, thank you. Um, a, a, a question relating to uh, other Chinese um, external initiatives, looking at China's standards 2035, does the ambition there fill you with the same sense of foreboding um as it were as as one belt one road china has a domestic industrial policy and that has focused in recent decades on import substitution manufacturing and the fastest possible technological upskilling the goal has been essentially to keep driving productivity through investment rather than consumption, uh, to push as quickly as possible into new high-tech industries like cars, uh, semiconductors, high value add components that are generally exported mostly by the United States, Europe, and Japan. And that is a domestic project that has been ongoing for a long time. It was first made in China 2025. Now there are 2035 goals. And I think China's, China's goal is what they call Zili Gangsheng, self-reliance in everything technological. So that the United States, for example, can't decapitate Huawei by cutting off its supply of semiconductor chips. In the past, I think this was poorly or only very loosely linked together with the Belt and Road concept. Because the Belt and Road concept was essentially redirecting money that might otherwise have been invested at home and dumping it abroad. In the course of 2021, I think you're going to see more disciplining of the Belt and Road project, as I said before, to focus on public health, green tech, and digital services. And another way to think about that is the Belt and Road is being brought more closely into alignment with China's domestic economic goals. Coming out of the pandemic, Xi Jinping's advisor, Liu He, is now firmly in the driving seat uh, in domestic economic policy. And he has indicated through what he calls the dual circulation theory that China needs to focus, needs to get serious for the, for the first time about building up a, a base of domestic consumption and trying to drive growth more from consumption than from investment. And another way to think about that is at home as well as abroad, China is going to stop pouring money into very high risk ventures. And it's going to try to encourage growth more through trade than from investment. Thank you. Um, a, a question about internal responses to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Bijan Omrani asks, have there been uh, any critiques from within China itself um, of Xi's approach to uh, the Belt and Road as a, as a domestic political ideology? There have been a few, uh, mostly rather oblique. Uh, in the early days, when the concept itself was being formulated, uh, there was a lot of actually quite frank and open debate 
among senior uh, Chinese academics, people like Wang Jisu at Peking University or Justin Lin, the famed economist. And they had very different ideas for what the contours of this should be, how it should be funded, what banks, whether it should be Chinese banks or multilateral development banks that should actually channel the funds, what the geographic uh, limitations of the Belt and Road should be. And one of the things that I argue in the book by tracing the, the lineage of this idea is because of the committee-like way that the CCP elite likes to make decisions, the, the consensus was essentially all of the above. So anyone who wanted to spin their own projects as Belt and Road related uh, would be allowed to do so. And that's why we have a digital Silk Road, we have a Silk Road in outer space, we have an undersea Silk Road. Um, it has extended so vastly in terms of different domains, in terms of geographies, in terms of industries, that it now covers almost everything. And it means everything and nothing. Uh, this makes it hard to criticize because everyone has something to gain from being associated with it. Uh, but there have been oblique critiques, mindful that to criticize it explicitly is perhaps to, to incur the wrath of uh, the party hardliners who want to show that they themselves are the most loyal to Xi Jinping. Uh, we have heard rumors that behind closed doors, some former reformists are concerned about Xi Jinping's whole industrial strategy, including strengthening the state sector and slowing down market-based reforms. And I think those two are linked. Uh, but no, because this has become so central to Xi Jinping's own cult of personality, very few senior Chinese people will dare to criticize it explicitly and in public. Overseas, if they're traveling to the United States or London, maybe in a pub when no one is listening and they're speaking off the record, they'll tell me what they really think. Thank you. And uh, I'm conscious that we've been working you very hard, um, Ike. Um, and um, uh, it's now 10 past three, but I, I would like just to uh, take one more area before we close, if I may, and, and that is um, um, rather close to the subject you were talking to us about in November. Um, uh, we now know that there will be a Biden administration um, in the United States from the 20th of January, uh, assuming nothing extremely bizarre uh, happens in the Senate tomorrow. Um, what is the prospective response of the new Biden administration um, to the People's Republic of China with respect to BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative? It, are they likely to continue the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy or um, might they turn to a more conciliatory stance that is still aimed at containment um, uh, rather than uh, working through a direct counter or rollback? Joe Biden himself has undergone a change of heart about China. Uh, not too long ago, he told a crowd in Iowa that China's not a threat to us. China's not a threat to us. You think China's going to eat our lunch? Come on, man, he said. And he was ridiculed for those comments. And after that, he spoke only rarely about China on the campaign trail. Uh, reading between the lines, one could argue that Biden doesn't think China is a very high priority. When he gave his Democratic convention uh, speech accepting the nomination for president. He named a litany of challenges that the United States faces, including the pandemic, inequality, racial injustice, and climate change. And he didn't name China on that list. Uh, you can be sure that if Trump had given a similar speech, or any Republican for that matter, China would have been, if not at the top of the list, then definitely in the top three. It's also notable, I think, that Biden hasn't nominated any Asia experts, let alone China experts, uh, to the top level of cabinet positions in his administration. Uh, Tony Blinken, the incoming presumptive Secretary of State, um, is a Europe expert. And Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has written a bit on the Belt and Road, um, but really very little. And that's not his, that's not his specialty. So one way we, that we can think about this is as Biden indicated in an interview to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times a few weeks ago, the United States needs leverage 
in order to deal with China. In other words, it's more effective to bargain with China collectively than unilaterally. And the US doesn't have that yet because we're not on the same page with our allies, particularly the Europeans who are in the process of inking a major investment deal with Beijing about what the, what the common framework should be, the common set of expectations should be that we should expect China to respect. I think a big effort of the first year of Biden's administration will be diplomatic. There will be an effort to uh, get Iran back into compliance with the nuclear deal, to seal a new Paris Agreement or to rejoin the Paris Agreement. Uh, that's going to entail a lot of negotiation with China. There's going to be a need to uh, resolve some of these arms control issues that have been ignored under Trump. Uh, through a deal with the Russians. And then there's going to be an effort to do outreach to the Europeans in particular, but really to all of the America's democratic allies, including in the Indo-Pacific, uh, to try to hear them out and see what common ground can be. If I'm right, though, and the Belt and Road is offering a very valuable uh, value proposition to a lot of recipient countries, including Germany, which has been pushing the comprehensive investment agreement with China. Biden might actually find that this diplomatic effort is not as straightforward as he might believe it to be. In the long term, I think the structural trends are pushing the US and China into competition. They're in geopolitical competition in Asia because China wants, China wants essentially some hegemonic control over at least the first island chain, if not beyond. And I think that this is, this is a, uh, revisionist idea that is unacceptable to American allies in the region. So ultimately, the United States and China are going to be pulled into ever more intense competition. I think we have to hope, though, that that is a managed competition and that it, it leads to productive investments in new technologies on both sides and perhaps even targeted collaboration on issues like climate change. What we want to make sure is that this is, this is an orderly geopolitical uh, competition that resembles more the second stage of the Cold War, where we had, for example, arms control agreements and some basic understandings of what is and is not acceptable. And I think another effort will be to try to get rules of the road in the cyber domain to make sure that a, a cyber attack committed by one against the other doesn't spill over into a kinetic conflict. But these are the challenges that, that lie before Biden, and I think they're not inconsiderable. Um, but the first target from Biden's perspective is to get Europe back on sides. I thank you very much indeed. That, that has been fantastic. Um, I, I fear we are going to have to uh, draw the questions to an, an end there. There are many still outstanding, and I, I do apologize to those uh, whose questions uh, we haven't been able to reach. Um, uh, the answers to some of them could quite well be in Ike's book. I, I'd just like to thank you, Ike, for giving us a really a, a, a very, very fine start to 2021, certainly a much better one than COVID is giving us. And uh, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone.